There's no end of high-end hardware and maybe high-end thinking here at level one. I'll tell you right now, hardware raid is basically dead for the high-end high-speed 64 cores of awesome goodness. Support for it has gone away at a hardware level a long time ago. And so what the very definition of RAID means has evolved and changed somewhat, probably not for the better. And if you expect RAID to help prevent data corruption, you've missed the boat on what RAID has become. In the past, RAID meant that you had both physical device redundancy in case of failure and the ability to de detect and correct data errors, even errors not reported by the drives themselves. Correcting errors, bit rot, is important, make no mistake, but almost all modern hardware and software RAID solutions rely on the drives themselves to honestly report errors. That means many of the types of RAID arrays, especially hardware assist or pure hardware RAID arrays, do not actually verify the data that they are giving you is the same data that you originally gave them for storage. And that is madness because it can be an opportunity for bit rot to set in. Now, some things, I think, that should not have been forgotten were lost. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it. Raid! So what got this started was I got a chance to play with Supreme Raid SR1000. For me, the marketing of that thing evokes a sense of yesteryear when software RAID was really bad, slow, and unreliable, and hardware RAID cards were just magical. They went with mechanical hard drives and they abstracted away all the complexity and everything just worked and they handled errors really well. The G-RAID 1000 is a card that promises to offload parity calculations and it does perform impressively. I like what it promises to do, but I really, I don't like the implementation. You gotta go fast, but if you're gonna go fast, you gotta understand the dangers that you're getting yourself into. And bit rot is not one of the use cases this thing covers. The promise here is if you have an array of multiple NVMe drives, you could give up the capacity of one or two of them for redundancy. That way any one of them can fail and things will keep right on working. Now it does support RAID 0 and RAID 1, both of those offer just speed and, and RAID 1 will do mirroring, but there's no parity calculation involved in that, it's just mirroring, so it's not really offloading a lot in that case. What's interesting is parity calculations around RAID 5 and RAID 6. Well, how it's implemented is with a not super modified NVIDIA GPU, the NVIDIA T1000, theoretically that does any RAID calculations, RAID parity calculations rather than the CPU. But this is a PCI Express 3.0 by 16 card, and that means that the absolute maximum that it can perform at is 16 gigabytes per second. That's the max bandwidth of a PCI Express 3.0 by 16 card. 16 gigabytes per second, and yet in their press release, they're talking about 100 gigabytes per second in the reads. That seems very fast. If the PCIe bandwidth is 16 gigabytes per second, but you can read at 100 gigabytes per second plus, how does it verify that the data it's returning to you is the data that you gave it? The data that it's returning matches the checksum and parity that's theoretically stored somewhere. Well, there are no connections on the card. It's just a PCIe card, so it's gonna happen over the PCIe bus, right? Nope, turns out it doesn't happen at all. It doesn't verify crap. I checked it by injecting a tiny bit of corruption and uh, it doesn't, doesn't detect it. Their website says, G-RAID, Supreme RAID, shoulders all the IO processing and RAID computation burden. The first part can't be true because there's not physically enough IO bandwidth to carry all of the IO data to the array. It's just the parity data. You're gonna max out at 16 gigabytes per second. It doesn't do that. It's obviously not doing that if the array can be faster than the physical interface of the card. So the explanation is that it doesn't check for parity unless a drive is totally missing or an NVMe drive itself actually reports the error. This is maybe a little disturbing because a lot of IT pros still have the expectation that hardware RAID controllers, especially ones that build themselves as enterprise class, can detect and correct errors on the fly, not just handle the case that a whole drive has gone offline or that a drive is reporting an error. This thing, the G-RAID 1000, it cannot detect silent corruption type of errors to save its life. Search the manual for verify or patrol or integrity or consistency or scrub. It doesn't have a way to initiate a, a scrub from the user side of things. I'm told they're working on that, but there's nothing in the manual that indicates that it could scan a volume for inconsistencies. And the website also mocks the RAID 5 write hole. It says, and to maintain data integrity of the cache in the event of a power loss, a battery backup is also required. 
The card will uh, suffer a huge performance drop if it fills up. If the battery is exhausted or the module's full, it'll need to switch to write through mode in order to preserve data integrity. Well, guess what? G RAID 1000, it's, it's gotta be a little careful there throwing stones because uh, it's a device that also lives in a glass house. So instead, it looks to me like in the case of the RAID 5 write hole, this card is just keeping performance high by casting your data into the void in scenarios where the RAID 5 write hole might affect you because I can easily introduce corruption and in order to detect corruption, it's gonna do a full rescan. We did it, team! Woo! But I'm picking on G-RAID when really this also affects a lot of enterprise solutions. Even Linux MD, Linux MD RAID, it actually has the partial parity log, which helps close the RAID 5 write hole and keep the array consistent. But even if these folks did that, there would be extra writes, which is a cause of a loss of performance. So Linux MD is a little safer in that regard, but Linux MD also doesn't verify the parity, except and unless a drive reports an error, a drive self reports an error. So the marketers would gaslight you into believing this was always the case and that no RAID has ever been responsible for bit rot and silent corruption. But come with me, step back in time for just a moment. We're gonna take a look at old school RAID. Our story starts really in the 1980s, but we can fast forward a bit until 2002. Enterprise RAID 5 in 2002 would absolutely detect silent corruption and correct silent corruption and then use the parity data to figure out what was wrong in enterprise storage. So what makes RAID 5 work better in 2002 than 2022? Well, let's think through it. If you had five drives in a RAID 5 and you fetched four chunks of data and one chunk of parity from those drives, but the parity is inconsistent, who's lying? Which drive is lying to you? How do you know which one's inconsistent? Is it a block of data that's wrong or is it the parity that's wrong? The answer in 2002 was that there was more information than just the parity. You see the sector size of the hard drives were also larger, eight bytes larger. Now let's, let's go for aside for a second and talk about sector size. A sector is the smallest parcel of info that a drive will work with. Going back more than 30 years, hard drives could operate in one of two modes formatted with 512 byte sectors or formatted with 520 byte sectors. You can't just write one byte on a hard drive, you see, it's done a sector at a time. Now it is true that some hard drives might not support 520 byte sectors, but you better believe that an enterprise grade hard drive could absolutely support a 520 byte sector for these reasons. The RAID controller itself would store a checksum of the 512 bytes of data in the sector in the extra eight byte. So you have 512 bytes of data and then a checksum that goes in the last eight bytes and the RAID controller was responsible for that. So when you created a RAID array, the hardware RAID controller would uh, create that on a 520 byte uh, volume of 520 byte drives, but then it would present it as a 512 byte volume to the operating system because most operating systems don't know how to handle anything except 512 byte sectors. Now eight bytes, that's not enough for error correction, but in our same five drive, you know, RAID five example, the controller has extra bytes every sector on every drive to see which drive is lying. It doesn't rely on the drive to tell it that it's lying. The other reason it worked like this is performance. If you stored 512 bytes in one place and then the extra checksum somewhere else, that's two mechanical hard drive seeks. And hard drive seeks are measured in milliseconds. That's just too much overhead. Making the sector a little larger from 512 bytes to 520 bytes was much less of a perform performance impact uh, on the read operation. You could also use a really complicated parity algorithm with parity blocks, where the parity and the data blocks are much larger than the sector size, usually to the tune of a half a megabyte, a megabyte, something like that. But uh, you, you get a lot of overhead with bigger sectors. It's not great for performance. It's computationally kind of expensive to work with blocks that big. So why not 520 byte sectors today? Well, drive vendors charged a lot for the option for 520 byte sectors, especially toward the end there. On top of that, 512 bytes is also too small in 2022. Almost all hard drives of the last five years use four kilobyte sectors. That is 4096 bytes or four times 512. Here is a SanDisk two terabyte flash drive from 2017. This is enterprise grade. Guess what? 520 byte sectors on this. It's built for the enterprise. Now it's a dying breed. Anyway, back to 2022. Almost all hardware RAID cards today, if you have a 512 byte or a 4K sector, they don't do any parity checking unless the drive itself reports an error. 
it is almost unicorn territory to find a hardware RAID controller that will use parity information without one of the drives speaking up and saying, hey, I've got a problem. Well, enter RAID 6, two parity drives. So with two parity drives, you are storing parity information in two places. It's kind of like the separate checksum information in a large uh, sector, and it's also computationally less expensive. So you can figure out who is lying as long as only one drive is lying. Of course, the downside with RAID 6 is that it takes another extra drive of redundancy. If I have five drives with RAID 5, I have four drives worth of RAID, comp RAID capacity. If I have RAID 6, I only have three drives worth of capacity. What about the G-RAID SR1000? Well, it turns out with RAID 6, it doesn't check the parity either, unless the drive reports a problem. Of course, neither does Linux MD RAID, or at least it didn't initially, and no one has updated the man page, so I think it still doesn't. How did I test all this? Well, I introduced some, some minimal corruption. In the case of our SanDisk 2 terabyte flash drives from 1273 AD, I updated the data, but I did not update the checksum. The LSI hardware RAID controller immediately flagged it and said that, that there's an inconsistency. It took a while to do the IO, but it fetched the parity and reconstructed the data because it knew that the block that I messed with was messed up because I took care to mess with the data block. Uh, I injected Gandalf.txt into, uh, into one of the drives in the RAID 5. So, it looks to me like the G-RAID is only checking parity when the drive itself actually reports an error. And the drive itself doesn't report an error if it doesn't think there's an error. So me injecting an error doesn't actually cause an error the way that it did with our SanDisk 520 byte sector drive. So what does that mean in the real world? That means that there is nothing going on with this RAID controller to check and verify that the data that you gave it is actually the data it's giving back to you. G-RAID never complained or noticed the inconsistency. Didn't matter if I use RAID 5 or RAID 6. Now RAID 5, like I say, could maybe be forgiven for the reasons I explained, but RAID 6? I mean, I guess. I remember I mentioned on the G-RAID website they seem to be making fun of the whole RAID 5 battery. Well, with modern controllers, it's not a battery, it's a super capacitor, but okay, that's fine. What is happening there on the hardware RAID controller in that server over there is that it's keeping a journal in memory of all the stuff it was doing, all the writes and everything else. So if it loses power or crashes, the little battery or the supercapacitor will keep track of that. It's a journal, basically, of everything it was doing for the last few seconds. When it comes back on, it doesn't immediately clear the RAM. It checks the RAM and checks the last few things it was doing. And then it checks all the drives to see how far they made it. If there's an unclean shutdown, the RAID controller can look at what was being written, since we still have the data in the RAM, because it's preserved, and it will check and make sure that it's perfectly consistent. That closes the RAID 5 write hole. Now Linux MD, software RAID on Linux doesn't by default store a write log like that. It can on a non-volatile device, but nobody ever does that. Uh, so uh, it has something else called the partial parity log. And so it writes out to the partial parity log what it's about to do, and then it does it with all the drives, and then it writes to the partial parity log that it finished it. And that slows things down because, well, it's got to do all that extra writing. And then even after an unclean shutdown, it still fully rechecks everything. The G-RAID card, well, it will only do a full rescan or consistent consistency check after a crash or power loss. It doesn't have anything like the partial parity write log or anything like that that I can find. And so the performance is better because it doesn't do any extra writing. The battery, the card with the battery, the supercapacitor, it doesn't have to do a rescan or anything. I mean, it does support consistency checks to be sure, but it is able to make sure that it's consistent, so you save there. Sometimes RAID cards uh, call that scan a patrol read or consistency scan. On Linux MD, you can schedule a rescan so that it'll scan all the drives and make sure everything's perfectly consistent with the parity and issue any corrections. Oh, and Linux MD, again, does another really boneheaded thing here. If there's an error in the parity, but no drives are reporting an error, it will rewrite the parity, even if the data was incorrect. Well, that seems boneheaded and wrong to me. Oh, speaking of that, that's exactly what the G-RAID card does too. It assumes that if it's in a RAID 6 configuration and it encounters one piece of information that's wrong, it will rewrite the parity, not affecting the data, even if the data had a problem. Ugh. Ugh. What a mess. That's, you know, it sounds like it's mostly directed to G-RAID, but in reality, it's just modern RAID. And this is why modern RAID is basically dead. It's because this is a mess, and as a system administrator, especially on <laughs> enterprise gear, you don't want to deal with this. You're going to have the extra write overhead, and you want to maximize performance. You need a technology that combines the ideas of RAID with the particular complexities of a file system. 
The file system itself should be the thing that understands that it's working with multiple physical drives, multiple NVMe drives, multiple whatever. And is it, it's probably a good idea to have the file system abstract away the storage instead of a RAID card. Deal with it at a system level. The file system can journal writes, as they often do anyway, but also the journaling can be hardened against things like the RAID 5 write hole. The system can see that it's working with multiple different devices, multiple different block storage. ZFS and RAID Z does exactly that, and ZFS does it well. To a lesser extent, so does BTRFS. Both ZFS RAID Z and BTRFS absolutely positively do an integrity check on reads, and it will give you an I.O. error if it's about to give you a file that has a different checksum than what it was when it was originally stored, which is great. Make sure that bit rot doesn't happen. I created the exact same testing scenario that I used here. RAID Z caught it, passed with flying colors that actually corrected the error, issued a thing to the system log, and said, hey, here's your file. It's exactly what you gave me. Instead of needing, needing 520 byte sectors though, the checksum and the location of the parity data is built right into the file system that helps minimize the amount of extra IOs. Unlike almost all RAID controllers, this setup also works for RAID 1 or mirroring. Uh, sometimes it's called uh, ZFS mirroring, but uh, it's mirroring basically. BTRFS works pretty much the same way, although RAID 5 and RAID 6 code with BTRFS not quite as hardened. But BTRFS also has some other innovative ideas which are sort of new and fun. If you have five drives and you want to use a file that is mirrored across all five drives, you can create and set a policy for that at the file level. And that's exactly what happens. If the checksum of one file doesn't match, it's got four more mirrors. It's a good argument for system administrators making decisions about redundancy at the entire volume level. What I mean by that is instead of taking a bunch of NVMe drives and deciding we're going to have one drive's worth of redundancy across the entire storage pool that's made up of all of these, you can just say, this folder should be mirrored across all five devices. This folder doesn't need any redundancy. This folder needs RAID 5 levels of redundancy. This folder needs RAID 6 levels of, of redundancy, so where it will tolerate one or, or two failures. You can even do RAID 10. You can say, I need this to be as fast as possible. And you don't really have to pre-allocate the entire storage device for a particular level of redundancy. You can set it as a policy at a file level or a folder level, whatever makes sense. And this is a new modern good idea, and even ZFS doesn't do this yet. I definitely think storage that lets you create a policy and have whatever level of replication of redundancy you want is probably the future. If we look elsewhere in truly enterprise solutions, stuff like what NetApp has, for example, enterprise storage provider, we see the same kind of policy-based redundancy in that enterprise storage. Oh yeah, and by the way, NetApp does the parity verification on read, so. Now, admittedly, the parity verification on read is less common today than ever, even with enterprise-ish solutions from Dell and HP and others, but no, I, I think G-RAID would have been far more useful and interesting as a product that accelerates parity calculations in Linux, maybe even with ZFS. They're open source, and writing the modules to do that is entirely possible. Oh, by the way, the SR1000, it doesn't have ECC memory on board. So the GPU parity calculation that's not needed until you actually have a problem, or at least not checked until you have a problem. Gee whiz, yeah, there's no error correction on the card. So if it's introducing its own errors, you'd never catch it. I mean, it's a cool idea to use the GPU as a data accelerator, but PCI3 and playing it a little fast and loose and hardware RAID 5 and... Yeah, I don't know. It's got one foot in the future and one foot in the past because the reason there's not RAID... NVMe solutions is because it doesn't make sense anymore. I certainly don't trust an NVMe device to tell me if it's malfunctioning. I mean, what kind of crazy clown world is that? The best approach really is to handle the redundancy at the file system level. Period. Do the integrity checking there. This isn't to say that, you know, an offload accelerator for some computation isn't a good idea, but ultimately, this doesn't provide data integrity protections against bit rot, even in ideal scenarios. And that's not really a dig at G-RAID, but pretty much where RAID is now. RAID is just a checkbox for people that are looking for it, but don't understand it. If you look into RAID 5 and RAID 6, you're gonna be disappointed. Even with Linux MD, RAID 6, and there's a silent inconsistency, it's gonna clobber the data. So it's kind of marketing nonsense. Oh, and before I forget, RAID, is not a backup. ZFS and BTRFS and approaches like that, they're gonna be slower, cause guess what? <laughs> they're doing more work. These other approaches are faster because they're doing less stuff. They're not checking the data. 
So NVMe, check it out. This is a Samsung 983 Pro NVMe. It's an M.2 format, so probably familiar to you. Look at the top of this card. This is mostly capacitors. Why the heck would they make an extra tall, extra long 110 millimeter M.2? Most of the ones you've probably seen are 80 millimeters. Why would they do this? Why are there so many capacitors on the top of this? This is power loss protection. This is the same thing as our super capacitor in our, in our RAID setup, because it turns out in order to make flash memory go fast, you've got to do a lot of parallel writes. So that whole RAID 5 write hole, it exists here on this card. There's a CPU here and RAM. This thing is doing computation, even though it's a self-contained device, there's a lot of crazy shenanigans going on with this. If this thing loses power at the wrong moment, these power loss capacitors help ensure that internally this thing is as consistent as it possibly can be. If you build your NVMe array out of NVMe drives that don't have these, then chances are they're, they're going to silently corrupt your data. So do you really think you can trust this to tell you if the data is correct or not? My experience is, no, you can't. But I do think it's interesting that enterprise grade NVMe drives have lots and lots of power loss capacitors. Now, does this matter for ZFS? Do you need the power loss capacitors for ZFS? Well, it helps, but it's not critical because ZFS has paranoid levels of paranoia in terms of is the data that it's getting back from the block device, what it gave to the block device. It doesn't trust the block device as far as it could throw it. And that is a great philosophy. Now, ZFS might not be the fastest and it might not have all the G-Wiz features that you can get from, you know, truly enterprise solutions like the NetApp stuff. But you'll never get a file back from it that you didn't give to it in the first place. At least not without a lot of loud complaining from ZFS. And that, at the end of the day, is what is most important to me. I'm Whittle, this is Level 1. This has been a quick look at RAID and, and all its forms and discussing some of its failures and its evolution over time.